My name's Alex and I've been a beekeeper since the summer of 2021. I'm a bit nervous. I'm not gonna lie, I am scared. Oh my God, look at that. And over the past few years, I've realized that bees are incredible animals. And this year I've challenged myself to another year of beekeeping with the aim to harvest honey and wax at the end of this summer. Last year I managed to harvest 12.5 kilograms of honey. So that is the number we need to beat. Today is gonna to be the last day of the year where I'm going to look inside my beehive and have an inspection and see how the bees are getting on. But there's one main reason I need to look inside the beehive today, and that is because there is something called a Varroa destructor mite, which parasites on honeybees. Now, originally, the Varroa destructor mite was only present on the eastern honeybee, which is another species of honeybee. Apis, what's the Latin? Apis serrana. But when the Varroa mite came in contact with the western honeybee, the western honeybee wasn't ready for it. It hadn't evolved with the Varroa mite, so it caused a lot more damage. And I've heard that as a beekeeper, you should really do something about it. Now, it's a little bit controversial because some beekeepers say, don't treat your bees, let the bees adapt, become more immune to the Varroa mite. Other beekeepers say, you must treat them, you must kill all the mites and, and get rid of them. As a new beekeeper, it can be very confusing, you know, co contradicting information. Like, what, what do you do when you don't actually know much about it yourself? And I mean, I looked inside my hive the other day. I did a mite check, which is basically putting a board underneath the hive, letting mites drop from the bees onto this board. You take the board out and then you look and then you see how many mites there are present. There are quite a few of them. Like quite a few were dropping down each day. And even on the back of the bees, I could see these little brown mites like attached to the back where they are. I think they suck the blood of the bees and slowly kill them and make them weak. I've heard that the varroa mite doesn't actually always kill the bee, but it can weaken the bee, which leads to secondary like infections and diseases. So I want to treat my bees with something to, uh, to kill them off. So we're gonna head into the garden, open up the hives and do some treatment and kill the varroa destructor mites. Gosh, am I a bad human for killing mites? I don't know, I want my bees to survive. I want them to be healthy. And I think if you were, any other farmer or if you if your pet dog or cat had a illness you'd want to treat it you know you, you love your pets and my 20 or so thousand bees out there are all my pets so i want to give them a helping hand let's go let's treat the bees after beekeeping for a year i've resorted to using a blowtorch to light my smoker because it's a lot quicker and easier <sighs> Oh, hey! One of my favourite parts of beekeeping is using the smoker. It's just a lot of fun, blowing smoke. Now things are getting serious. I've got this treatment called Apivar, which is um, made by a company called Veto Pharma, made in France. Uh, it is a dedicated apiculture product, so it's uh, for beekeeping and treating varroa mites. It says here, the active ingredient is amitraz, which is a sublethal miticide, which I, I believe sublethal means that it doesn't directly kill the mites, it paralyzes them, and then they starve to death. Pretty brutal, but I hope that it, um, it does the job. Apivar, it comes in strips. I heard that most colonies in the winter, they die because of becoming weak due to large infestations of varroa mites. So that is why I really want to treat these mites because I don't want my bees to die. Because if they die, then I have to get new bees next year and start the whole process again. Now my bees have been rather angry recently. I think at this time of year, they're really on guard. They don't want anyone going into their hives. Um, I got stung on my finger the other day. And it was really painful, but hopefully they're going to be nice today. Oh, wow. Now that's a good sight. Every, that is solid honey. Like, solid. There's nothing but honey on that frame. And the other side as well. Oh my goodness. 
that's a really good sign because bees need, I think, 30, 40 pounds of honey to survive a winter. Like, that's a rough estimate. But yeah, that is really good news. And that frame as well, solid. That's really dark colored, that stuff. Check out that. It's just wall to wall, solid honey. There's my queen. Spot the queen. It's pretty easy because it's got a dot on its head. Stung. Only just got me though. Ow. That's painful. Yeah, these gloves, these gloves, what, what? They're pointless. There's so many bees. That is crazy how healthy this hive looks. These strips contain the amateurs. So apparently the way these strips work is you want the mite to come in contact with the strip. So you put this in, the bees have the mite on their back, they brush alongside this, and then the mite gets paralyzed. So I want this to be in the busiest area of the hive. I've got two of them. You're gonna put two in for a full-sized hive like this but I want them mostly around the brood area because if it gets cold, they will all go towards the brood area and the brood area is around here. And hopefully that kills a lot of the mites and I have a nice healthy hive going into next year. So that's the last inspection of the year. I will have to go inside the hives in between six and 10 weeks time to take out those treatment strips because you're not going to leave them in too long because you don't want the mites to become resistant to the amitraz chemical inside the treatment. So I have to take them out, but other than that, I'm just going to leave them and fingers crossed they survive till next spring. I'm actually quite worried that my bees aren't going to make it this winter because it has been so, so wet. And I've heard that the cold doesn't really affect bees too much, like they can deal with it. There's bees living far north in Scandinavia and Alaska. Uh, they can deal with very cold temperatures, but it's the dampness and the wetness of their hive which can really cause them to fail over winter. And it has just been raining constantly for the last like two weeks. And I checked inside one of my hives the other day and the whole of the inside of the lid was wet. So I replaced the roof on one of the hives to um, hopefully make it waterproof again. There's not really much else I can do. I can't stop the rain. I can't change the weather. So we're just gonna have to hope that it dries up. It's a pretty bleak December day and I'm going to check on my bees. I've got to remove the treatment that I put in about eight or nine weeks ago for the Varroa mites. And also I need to check the weight of the hives to see if they've got enough food because currently there's not many flowers about so I need to feed them if they get low on their stores. Oh, and I got some new beekeeping attire. These are my shoes. They are now my gardening and beekeeping shoes. They're like slip on shoes. They're made of wood and leather. They're not exactly gonna stop the bees from stinging me but I think they're really nice. Using the smoker is so much fun. I'm coming in, bees, but as quick as I can. These were the Varroa mite strips. Hopefully they did the trick. The way we will know if they did the trick is by putting in some boards underneath the hive. I'm gonna leave them there for about a week, pull them out, and if there's no mites, then the job has been done well. Strip one out. Strip number two. Calm it, calm it, calm it. All right, we'll go back inside, go back, go back to bed. My poor bees, looks like they're not doing too well, but it is very natural, I believe, to see dead bees at the front of the hive in winter. 
because the colonies shrink from like 60,000 bees to, I don't know, 20,000 or uh, a lot less basically. After lifting this hive, I've realized that they do have quite a lot of stores in there. They probably have enough for now. But I want to do a test and see if bees take down this fondant sugar, which is a year old. So fondant icing is what bakers use, like it's icing sugar. But it's uh, a good feed for bees in the winter. Last year when I fed it, it was soft and the bees took it down very quickly. But it has now gone almost rock solid. And I'm not sure whether the bees will try and eat it still or not. So I'm gonna find out by doing a little experiment. So this is a feeder which was being used for sugar syrup. I'm gonna go on top like that. There's some bees in, this, in the bottom of this feeder. This feeder is for liquid sugar syrup. So the sugar syrup goes in and they eat it out. But in the winter, they don't take down liquid food when it's cold. So you need to feed them with fondant, which is a solid sugar. And I just get the lid and put it on top. This hive is a lot lighter than that one, which means they've got a lot less food inside here, which means they definitely need some fondant. This is called an eek. It's just a, an extra box to lift up the hive higher. So then I can place this on top so the food isn't causing a problem with putting the lid on. So here are the Varroa mite boards and we can come back in a week and just check that the treatment did the job. Slots in just like that. And now there's not a great deal to do apart from keep an eye on the, uh, the way to the hives, make sure they've always got some fondant icing to eat in case they get low on food. And I guess I will see these bees again in the spring. And this season I'm putting a little bit more effort into my record keeping because my memory is terrible and I want to keep track of everything that I do in the beehives and the dates that I do everything so I can then look back on it and know what I've done. Last year I was very unorganized. I lost a number of swarms because I wasn't keeping track of when things were happening. I'm, I'm going to be a better beekeeper this year and that is all done. See you in the spring. They're really small, kind of purpley brown things, <laughs> quite hard to spot. Most of this on here is what looks like wax cappings, some pollen. Because when they eat through their honey stores, they then drop the wax cappings onto, the, onto these boards. There's also a few dead bees. There's one mite, two mites. So to find a daily mite drop, which is how many mites drop in each day, you do some quick maths. There were two mites divided by seven, which is how many days. So I have a daily mite drop, which is how beekeepers measure the amount of mites of 0 0.28, which I believe is a very safe level now. Um, before, when I put the treatment in, I had a daily mite drop of about 10 or so. That's very good. And on the other hive, three mites on this one. But just because there aren't many mites now doesn't mean that next season they won't come back. Uh, there's a very good chance that throughout the season next year the, the mite levels will grow again uh, when they are reproducing more throughout the spring and summer. And then we'll have to do the same again next year uh, and, and treat them and make sure that you keep them under, under control. But at the moment, I think things are good. Well, my dad has finally given in to letting me have some more space in the garden for more beehives. So my plan for this next season is to expand. I want to go from two colonies to maybe, hmm, as many as I can fit over there. There's quite a bit of preparation I need to do before I get the beehives there. We need to clean out the space. We need to level off the ground. I need to make some hive stands to put the beehives on. And I think this spot here is a, is a very nice area because southwest is that way. So the prevailing wind comes from over there. So the bees will be sheltered behind the bush. 
the sun rises, I think, over there, southeast, which means they'll get early morning sun, which is good. And there, yeah. So you can go down to think. When I work on them, one facing that way, one facing this way. Yeah. And one facing. So you don't mind me having more bees in the garden? More bees, more honey. If you're gonna do it, you might as well do it properly. We're gonna make a start clearing Alex's apiary area. This is the year where Alex's beekeeping business expands into a multi-million pound company where we ship honey all the, all the way across the world and become the biggest beekeeping operation in the world. Seriously though, I want to expand my beekeeping. I want to have more than two hives because I want more honey. Because it turned out that last year, lots of people wanted to buy my honey and I couldn't sell them it because I had none of it. I ate most of it and gave some away to neighbors so I had none left. I got a notepad, tape measure. We got a fork, a oh, rake. That's a rake. And two people and we're gonna clean up the area. Secretaires. It's already looking cleaner. Three hive stands. They are what the hives stand on. I'm gonna make them out of wood. We found a frog. <laughs> I'm gonna put him in the undergrowth. One, two, three. Next step is to make some hive stands. Me and my dad are collecting wood for the for the beehive stands. There we are. From where my dad has shot me in the back. <laughs> 108 pounds for the wood. I learned that this wood most likely came from Scandinavia, which is not surprising because from my observations whilst traveling in that part of the world, they have a lot of trees. Today's job is to get on with some woodwork. I've got to build some stands for my beehives to sit on. And I've also got to build a tortoise shelter for my dad. My dad has a pet tortoise and the tortoise needs a new house for next spring because the other one rotted away. And today I'm going to be fueled by three eggs. These eggs come from a chicken. I'm gonna scramble them. Yum. My dad found a tortoise on an allotment when he was a kid and it's still alive now. I think it's something like 70, 80 years old. In the summer, she comes out of hibernation and lives in the garden. And in the day, she's roaming about in the garden and in the night, she goes into her little hut. The plan for the beehive stands is pretty simple. I'm just making a oblong shape out of wood and then having four legs made out of these posts for the hives to sit on. Stick fit. All I have to do is some cutting and some screwing. That's, a, that's about it. There we go. That is a stand that my bees are gonna sit on. I've got this floor of a spare beehive so I can test. And it fits on there perfectly. I'll be able to fit three beehives on each stand. So we've got an awful lot of space uh, if we need it. Now I just have to do the same again two more times. I'm gonna have three of these stands. It's a chilly day today. It was about minus five last night. So the bees will probably all be tucked up inside their hive. I'm gonna put my bee suit on and I'm gonna get one of the hive stands in place. I'm getting my bee suit on just in case, if anything, it's an extra layer of warmth. Cause it's so cold today. The bees are very quiet today. There's no bees flying. They're probably all tucked inside the hive. Huddling together like penguins. Ah, oh, that's heavy. That was really heavy. It's quite wonky.
I opened up the hives and had a look inside and they're feeding on their fondant icing, which I gave them. I am being prepared for what could happen. If I divide both those hives there once, I have four colonies. And then if I catch a swarm or I divide one of them again, I have seven. And that's pretty much like beehives on all of them. So I built some hive stands for my beehives and I thought, nice job done. And then my dad comes walking into the garden one day and he's like, you're gonna paint them? And I say, no, they do the job as they are. Don't really need to paint them, do I? And he said, no, you need to paint them because they don't look very nice and they need to be certain type of green or something. So I'm doing this purely to make him happy. I don't think they need to be plain painted. The bees don't need them to be painted. I've already got paint on my thumb. I'm gonna paint some wood. Painting has been interrupted because my dad is getting very excited about something in his greenhouse. <laughs> Look at that. What type of orchid is it? It's a cymbidium. If I had a bigger greenhouse, I'd probably have more. Mm. They look very... Delicate. Um, chic. It's like having a pet, yeah. I suppose. Nice, that was fun. Um, let's do some more painting. Working around interesting people is it's definitely something I enjoy because it can be very easy to get bogged down with your own job and having a little break and conversation with uh, someone else who is doing their thing, you know, it breaks it up a bit, creates a nice balance. Painting. I'm finding lots of my bees on like this potting bench outside the house. But they're on the plant as well. Uh, I think they're drinking water. Well, oh, that one's like in the water. They're making the most of the lovely weather today. Hey bees, how you doing? It's the last day of January and it's feeling pretty warm the sun is out and the bees are just going crazy it's the most active i've seen them since last like september time there's quite a few bees coming in with pollen on their legs which is a good sign because it means that they are finding flowers there's a lot of bees about which is good oh it's so good to see my little friends again they've been just tucked away inside their box all winter and i've hardly seen them they seem pretty docile at the moment as well they're not in an angry mood like they were last autumn. They really don't care that I'm standing so close to them. We still have about a month or two where it could get cold again, but uh, we should start to see more and more signs of spring coming. There's flowers starting to appear on some of the trees. Uh, the daffodils and snowdrops are coming out as well. Spring's coming. Now that I had some really nice painted beehive stands, I needed some more beehives to put on them. So I did some online bee shopping uh, for some new equipment. Whoa, this is expensive. It does look like an extraordinary price to pay for some boxes and beekeeping equipment, but I like to see it as an investment. You know, if this year goes well, then we might have a load of honey to sell and I might make that money back. So it kind of feels worth it. And also I'm probably gonna have loads of fun as well. So it doesn't feel so bad. Ah, oh, it's starting to feel more like spring. Today I'm picking up all my beekeeping equipment that I ordered online the other day. Luckily there's a local bee farm about half an hour away. So I can go to them pick up all the boxes and all the kit that I need for this year of beekeeping. Just getting everything prepared. Beekeeping season 
starts in about a month. That's when I'll have to start doing regular inspections of the bees. So I've got the next four weeks to prepare everything ready for that time. It's down this little country road and it's like a, um, like a drive-through, but for bee equipment. <laughs> That's so funny. I just picked up my beekeeping stuff and it turns out that the guys who work here um, had seen my beekeeping videos that I put on YouTube last year, which is kind of funny. It's mad. The world of social media connects so many different people. And just by me uploading a beekeeping video last year, like these people had seen it. Anyway, that's all the beekeeping equipment collected. I've now got to prepare everything over the next month, ready for my year of beekeeping. I am surrounded by lots of pieces of wood. And this year I want to expand my beekeeping operation slightly. So I thought today, whilst making up these beehives, I can show you and explain how a beehive is made up. Starting off with the, the wood. This is a Canadian cedar. Uh, it's a special kind of wood because it contains certain oils uh, that help it last longer and stay strong. However, cedar, this particular type of wood, is very expensive. And right here, surrounding me, is like hundreds of pounds worth of wood. Anyway, let's make some beehives, shall we? Now, I'm working with flat-packed beehive parts today. You can, you can, of course, if you're good at working with wood, make beehives from scratch. You can make your own wood, do all the notches yourself, However, I am no good with woodworking, especially accurate woodworking. So I have bought the pieces required and then I simply have to slot them together. So it shouldn't be too tricky. Smells nice. There's so many different parts in this one box. Give me a couple of minutes while I read this. Didn't take long. I'm already confused about all these bits of wood and where they're meant to fit into each other. I'll need to follow along on a YouTube tutorial at the same time, so this might take a while. Oh gosh, that took me about an hour. I thought putting these boxes together would be easy. We got one box done and I've got another five more to do. <sighs> I did a lot of frame building last year, so I think I remember how to do it. Pieces of wood, small nails, foundation. This is beeswax, and it's not absolutely necessary to make this because the bees will make the wax themselves, but it gives them a head start, and it also means that the frame is built uniformly in the shape of the frame. Because if you leave the bees to do it, the bees are likely to build like a wild comb shape. And for beekeeping purposes, you want it to be neat and uh, nice and oblong. Put the last piece of wood in. And there we have one of many that I need to make. But this goes into the beehive, and I'll show you that once I've built all the others. I spent the last couple of days in the house building boxes, and now I can show you how a beehive is made up. First, you've got the floor and the entrance block. With the floor I bought, you get a board which slides into the floor. This is the board that you can use to check 
Varroa mites. You can slide this in, then count how many are dropping through onto the board so you know if you have a problem. Goes onto the hive stand like so. Next, we got the brood box. Now the brood box is where the queen lays all the eggs. The brood box contains 12 of these frames. They're slightly deeper than the honey frames. The bees will draw out the comb and this is where they will have their nest. Next goes on this. This is a funny looking thing, but it's called a queen excluder. The worker bees can go through these little holes, but the queen can't. So you put this on top of the brood box so that when we have the honey supers on, these are the honey boxes where the bees store the honey, the queen can't get up through into the honey super and lay eggs in the honey section because you don't really want baby bees uh, inside your honey. As you can see, there's quite a size difference. The brood frame is larger than the honey frame. Now you can have honey frames the same size, but the idea I think behind having smaller honey frames is that they are very heavy to carry when they're full. So when you have a whole box, it's easier for the beekeeper to have a smaller frame to deal with. In some situations, you might have two of these brood boxes on top of each other so that the brood nest is really big and strong. On top of that honey box, you can then put as many honey boxes as you like. The amount of honey boxes that you have depends on how much honey your bees are making. You don't want to have loads of empty boxes which aren't being used. So if one fills up, you might add another one. And if the other one starts filling up, you might add another one. And then you just sort of play it by ear and see how many uh, you need. I've seen some hives with up to 10 of these boxes on full of honey, like this high, uh, where you need a ladder to get the whole way up. But that all depends on how much honey your bees are making. More honey, more boxes. Once you've put your last honey box on top of your hive, you then need uh, a lid. This is called a crown board. This goes on top, like so. That acts as the top of the bee's cavity. You may have noticed some holes in here. Now these are for when you need to feed the bees, uh, you can put feeders on top. And also when you're extracting the honey, you can put these little devices in, which mean the bees can go one way, but can't come out the other way. So you can empty a box full of bees by putting this under one of the supers. All the bees go through down there, then they can't get back up. So you've got a whole box without any bees in. And then lastly, and this goes on top. And there we have a complete cedar beehive. All we're missing is uh, some bees. But hopefully at some point this year, we might be able to split one of those original colonies and get another one. I'm really excited because it's finally warming up a bit and in a few weeks, maybe a month or two, we'll be able to look inside the hives and see what the bees have been up to. Thanks for watching this beekeeping episode. I will see you soon for more beekeeping stuff coming up. See ya, bye.